Last year, uh, roughly, uh, beginning of 2015, we started to get out the plans again uh, to look at finishing off Growing to Serve. The rest of that project, the part we had not finished. Uh, because we were, we were online to finish paying off this part by the end of this year, 2016, so we should start looking at that plan. It takes a long time to evaluate these things, and we always get out our plans again to look at them and evaluate them. Is this really what God wants for us? Is this really what we should do? And while we were in the process of looking at that, we were approached by another church in our region about the possibility of what they called a merger. And we talked about that a little bit last time. We did not say the name of the church. We weren't far enough along. Now we'll tell you what that church was. That church is Faith Baptist Church of Mill Creek, which was formerly for over 150 years, Faith First Baptist Church in Batavia. So put the picture up there of the, of the, of the street side. That's what Faith Baptist looks like today. It's in, Mil, in the Mill Creek subdivision. It's, it's about four and a half miles from where we are sitting right now. It's um, up uh, Main Street in Batavia going west for a few miles before you get to the Markland uh, uh, facility there. And you'll see this building right on the right. Some of you may know that if, about three years ago, uh, Grant Diamond left our staff and became the pastor of Faith Baptist in Mill Creek. And Grant is the one who approached us about a year ago about the possibility of a merger. Do we really expect more and more people to drive from farther and farther away to a bigger and bigger box here? Is that the end game? Is that what transform lives and impact the world will look like here. A bigger and bigger box here. We know that 80% of our worshiping congregation comes, lives within a 15 minute drive of our two campuses. What's it gonna look like? And I think the answer to that is no. And I think the answer to that, that God is beginning to crystallize for us, and we're in the very beginning processes of this, is a family of neighborhood churches committed to that mission family of neighborhood churches committed to seeing lives transformed and making an impact in the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Family, that's an important word for us. We use that word a lot around here. Families share the same DNA, biologically speaking anyway, right? They share the same history. You have stories in your family you tell every time you get together, right? We have families, as, stories as a church family we tell. If you've been around long enough, you know some of those stories. Families share the same leadership. They share the same responsibility. They hopefully, if they're a healthy family, share the same direction and purpose. That's what we mean by a family of neighborhood churches. Not necessarily clones, but I think we have a God-given opportunity and responsibility to reproduce who we are as a church. Not just to make it an infinitely large here in this footprint. We are beginning to see the Faith Baptist Mill Creek opportunity as a step in that process. It may be at some point in the feasibility phase, we come to the place of saying, mm, this, is not, this is unwise. I want you to know, I don't think that changes the vision. Even if this is a no on this one, I think the vision still is to reproduce ourselves in the neighborhood church model. And God will show us when and how to do that. I'm struggling now not to hold too tightly to this one because I get excited about the vision, right? I want to hold an open hand and say, God, you, you're, you've led us this far. You'll bring us where we need to be. So, At the same time, we're working in another direction. Uh, we are also studying, looking at this campus, our West Campus, to determine what needs to be done here, what yet needs to be done here uh, in terms of developing this campus. Jeff talked about not a bigger and bigger box so people drive from further and further away, but maybe a bit better box, and here's why. There are three things we're considering here at this campus. One is our nursery space is already stretched here uh, beyond its ability to care for our children and families well. Secondly, uh, this space here, our, our primary worship space, this is the largest um, program, if you will, that FBCG does on a regular basis. We, we have 52 Sundays a year when we have two services in this room, um, and lots of other things happen in this room. It's our largest venue, and this room was never built to be a permanent worship center. That was not the intent we built this. This was built as a multi-purpose room slash gymnasium. Can you tell? Uh, and the third thing we're thinking about is Shepherd's Heart. Our Shepherd's Heart ministry, uh, it, it, we were talking about that a lot. It's really exploding. Many of you are involved in that ministry. Uh, we addressed it when we rehab, rehabbed the East Campus, gave it its own space. It's a nice kind of storefront down there, adding dignity and, uh, to that whole ministry. And it's more than doubled in the past two years, both in terms of numbers of people serving, numbers of people we do serve, 
And uh, just so you know um, what our staff there, and led by Aaron Wise and of course Bruce McAvoy, overall our Serve the World initiatives, uh, they, what they say often is it's not about the food. Uh, we have what we believe is the largest gospel-driven, compassionate ministry in Kane County, which is, uh, now I don't know that for sure, but we believe it, it might be. That is, <laughs> we, just we don't just give out food, we don't just give away clothes, uh, we minister to people in, in, in the truth of the gospel, in the spirit of the gospel. There are sitting areas, we do counseling on Wednesday nights for financial counsel. We're getting to know people and their stories. We don't just hand out bags of food. Uh, and that ministry is growing in that way, which is very, very exciting to us. But it's trying to grow even more. Have you addressed yet uh, to us um, the motivation from that other church and why they asked for a merger and how does their motivation affect our feasibility studies? That particular question is a really good one. And so their primary motivation is that uh, Grant and their, the head of their board, and now their whole board and members of their church, see sort of the end in sight for the life cycle of their church. The term merger is a little bit misleading because uh, Jim Tomberlin in his book, Better Together, refers to all church you know, connections that this, of this sort as mergers, but they're not all the same kind of merger. We are what would be described as a rebirth, death and resurrection as it were, not a, uh, a full partnership, but a, okay, that, that entity ceases to exist, be a period of time where it would be shut down, where we would make some improvements to that property, develop our launch team and plan, and then it'd be re reborn as something new. For example, one of the issues uh, to be resolved as we work through this is what happens to their leadership and their staff. Uh, their leadership would not join our leadership, their leadership would cease to, their board would dissolve. We wouldn't be taking on any of their staff other than taking care of their pastor financially for a period of time. Um, and what would happen to their membership. Now, we would accept their members as becoming members of our church. Uh, that's one thing we've offered them. What's the financial implication? Um, are, they, are they carrying significant debt? What's the operating cost that we'd be picking up? Well, the two, those are two different parts of the question, and probably Doug, you can speak to this as well. We're in the process of examining all the financials. Operating costs, we would determine that because it'd be our plan and, and, and church DNA and, and operations there. The debt right now, I think, I don't know the exact number, but it's a neighborhood of, of a half a million dollars that they're carrying of debt. So not inconsequential, but not something that would be a deal breaker. Um, it's sitting on eight acres of property, uh, so there's, there's plenty of nice space there to expand that building or for whatever you need, but that's what the building looks like. The building itself would not be adequate for us to start a, a new campus there today. In addition to the half a million dollars to take to absorb their debt, we also need to study what it's going to take to make that a functional, uh, highly functional church and environment for a ministry to grow. So we have to look at that and see what, it, what that would cost. One of the beauties of the East-West situation now is having both of you having a pastoral presence in the building. And I wondered how you would account for that in a new site. We're talking about predominantly live preaching with a pastoral presence on that campus would not be either of us. However, in that, in, in, I could envision it this way. The campus pastor would preach live there twice a month. One of us might preach there live one other time a month, and they might have a video of one of us uh, once a month. So it would be a hybrid model, predominantly live preaching, but not exclusively so. The main thing we would need to do with, with that group is be very pastoral and understanding of the pain they're going through. This is a deep grief reaction for a lot of them who've been there for a long time. Imagine watching your church kind of die right around you, and you're part of it. I don't think we can kind of wrap our minds around how sad that is for some of them. And we would need to really go out of our way to welcome, to celebrate the best of their history, to acknowledge it really did happen. Uh, some of them came to know the Lord there. Some of them were baptized there. We're going to have to celebrate that history. At the same time, welcome them and allow them to go through a grieving process as they enter our midst. So we would, we would try to do a good job of that whenever that time is. All right. I'm glad yeah. Brian said that. I think we, we would want to set even some celebration moments in our services to celebrate and tell a bit of their story, to welcome them and publicly. And to, um, because even though it's a smaller congregation, it's not insignificant. And they're joined. There, there, there is, uh, we've talked I mentioned at length over dinner one night after Saturday night service that they came to visit where they told that story and I, I want to echo what Brian said it was touching 
sad, but uh, really realize that this, this, this story needs to be told and become part of our story, that together actually, we'd become something that didn't exist before. So it's, it's, uh, it's about a 10 minute drive, give or take. You know, traffic could be less, a little bit more if, if, you know, about that. If you drew circles around the, the two dots we have now of our campuses, a 15 minute driving, <laughs> there's a lot of overlap between east and west. There would be some overlap uh, between that one and, and our west campus. But you gotta imagine how far out that circle goes to where we're not reaching, uh, to people that aren't currently coming to that place. So it's, Mill Creek is kind of a world unto itself. We're reaching Mill Creek families. But imagine if we took a core of those Mill Creek families that were committed to the gospel and reaching their neighbors, and that became a growth engine then. And there's another circle drawn there. And then, who, there, I, you know, I'm not gonna place dots on the map, but you can imagine it with me, can't you? Other dots so, so far out. So we're not thinking 30 minutes out right now or an hour out, we're thinking inside of that sphere of influence because this first one, I don't know why I'm still standing, this first one I think really needs to go well. If this is what God's doing, we, we need to prayerfully and thoughtfully do this one really well so that we have sort of a template and a pattern then to do the next one when God brings that our way, whenever that happens. Yep. So my question is, you talk about a similar DNA moving some sort of leadership from here over to this campus. How do you extrapolate that out for doing that again and again? How do you continue to grow that leadership up within the church? I mean, it seems like you'd have to accelerate whatever plan you have in order to keep accommodating that vision. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's precisely why Brian's sticking around and what he's going to do next. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, that, we have started to really look at, at that and it gets us into uh, uh, We've, leadership development is part of what we're trying to do now, but we think we're kind of at the beginning edge of that. By leadership development, we mean our existing ministry staff, which is in several rings. We have our senior staff, we have our ministry staff, and they have all of our staff. And you may not know those rings are like, we have about 10 or 12 senior leaders who lead departments. We have about 30 ministry staff. And our total staff is about 55, if you include facilities people and administrative staff and those sorts of things. So we're, we're, we're building a culture of leadership development among our staff. We also have our summer internship program, which we call Leadership Institute. One of my roles in the coming few years will be to take what we're doing in leadership development and take it to the next level. Meaning, for example, building not just a summer internship program for college students that we have now. We have 13 kids coming in at the end of this month, by the way, to work all summer in our ministries. But to take that to what we're calling right now uh, a residency program that would be like a year to two years where we're actually training campus pastors, potential campus pastors, identifying them in our congregation or outside our congregation to work with us for a year or two, start learning preaching, start learning leadership, so that we fi are constantly finding the next team of people two years from now to go out. So that needs to be part of our DNA. If we're going to do this, we need to be developing the next generation of leadership prior to finding a, a place. So. Which a healthy church should be doing anyway. Right. And we kind of are un organically, but I see this as like, it's putting a microscope and like, say, okay, now you're gonna have to get intentional about what's sort of all just been happening in between the lines around here. Now you're gonna have to name it and, and lay it out and get clear about it and pray for it and pursue it.